Greetings everyone and welcome back to the bench. Let's build an amplifier. Well, if you watched my other video about the 4556 op amp, I mentioned, well, this chip delivers two or three times the current of your typical op amp like the 5532. It might be a good candidate for driving an output stage of a uh, small amplifier, you know, nothing serious, maybe around 10 watts or so. I figured, well, let's give it a shot. You know me, I gotta try. So this is the circuit. Now don't build this circuit out because I'm considering this the beginning or the first base type circuit. I already know from tinkering with these types of circuits that they don't work that well. They do work, just not that well. So I'm going to have to make improvements to it and we'll go along and I'll take you along on what I do to make it better. But the idea is it has to be simple. You know, it's just a simple op-amp circuit driving what's known as a push-pull emitter follower buffer. You know, this doesn't have any voltage gain. In fact, it's slightly less than one. So we're going to have all of our signal voltage at this point when we drive it into this output stage. Now to get started, I want to build these circuits and get them working independently. You know, negative feedback is taken off this point. Normally, it's taken from the output, but like I said, I want to get everything working before I do the global negative feedback. So right now, they're just independent circuits, and they're really only sharing the supply rails here with the supply bypass capacitors in between them. So we need to figure some things out here. If you notice some parts are not labeled yet. So I have to figure how much bias current that's going to flow. And because we're not using drivers, it's going to be a relatively large amount compared to a circuit with drivers. So what I need to do first is figure out how much current we need. Well, I want this thing to be compatible with 4 ohm loads. And I decided to use a plus 12 and minus 12 dual supply. So what happens when the output swings up to the positive rail or down to the negative rail, it's going to require the maximum current. So we need to know the peak current, not the RMS. So if you take 12 volts divided by 4 ohms, you get 3 amps. Now I'm not going to worry about speaker impedance. There'll be some overhead in the uh, design of this thing, so it should be fine. And a real circuit, the output won't be able to swing all the way to the rails anyway. So yeah, again, we'll have some headroom. Now I'm going to use these MJE3055 and its complement, MJE2955. So I need to go look at the data sheet and see what the gain is on these things. So I can calculate how much current I need to drive these to get our three amps. Well, this is where the data sheet comes in handy. And there's both transistors right on one data sheet. And I know the voltages and the currents and all that were fine there, but I need to know that gain. So, uh, DC current gain. So, yeah, we'll use that. So, uh, yeah, this is current. We find the 3 amp line, which is that. And we go up to. And I'm going to ignore negative 55. I don't care about that. This is a more normal operating temperature. So 3 amps. That's the 40. So that's above that. It's between 40 and 50, 45, I would say. We'll just say 40. So it has a gain of 40. This is all calculator work. So I get my Radio Shack VFD calculator from 1976 and we'll punch in some numbers 3 amps divided by a gain of 40 we need 75 milliamps and that happens to be what this thing output is rated it actually can go higher than that but you'll start to lose um, amplitude in your waveform so yeah, we'll design for 75. You know, like I said, we did give it a little bit of headroom anyway, so not a big deal. 
So how do you figure the value of these resistors? Well, you can think of it as two resistors. You can ignore the voltage drops of the diodes. Uh, yeah, two resistors across 24 volts. And just do the math. 24 volts divided by 75 milliamps. 320, but you need two resistors, so you have to divide that in half. So we need each of these to be around 160 ohms. So we'll have to choose something in that range. You know, if that's not an exact value, you'd find, you'd probably find like a 150 or maybe a, a one, what's next, 180 or 220. So I have enough information to breadboard the circuit and uh, apply power, see what happens. And here's the circuit. Got everything hooked up here. So a couple things though. You know, I, these are the diodes here. They're used for sensing the, uh, the temperature of the outputs and help control the amplifier from thermal runaway. They also act as a bias spreader. So you get a little bit of bias current flowing. Well, I can't really put these on the heat sink. I mean, I could. I could solder wires and then glue them there. But, yeah, I don't want to monkey with that. They are close to the transistors, the legs there. That, you know, some of the heat will conduct down in there and, and warm the diode up. And hopefully it will thermally track okay. Okay, so I have the supply hooked up. Plus and minus 12 volts. I did set the current limit to 1 amp so I don't damage anything here. And let's turn it on. <laughs> That's not good. Sitting idle, it's drawing nearly half an amp. So uh, let's turn that off. I don't want to sizzle anything here. It's not really warm. It's not been on long enough. One thing I did run into is uh, I couldn't find the right resistors at 150 ohm. And, you know, these things have to dissipate over half a watt. So I, I went up to 220 ohm. And it might current starve the amp a little bit. But like I say, with the headroom, I think we'll be okay. We'll just use these because I had them. Well problem is here with that current we're drawing so much current through this circuit that um, it's causing the uh, bias voltage to be too wide here so more currents flowing through here we need to collapse this down a little bit so less currents flowing through the output at least I think that's what's going on here I need to measure it make sure it's just not something hooked up wrong also, the op amp is not connected to this point yet because I want to get this thing sorted out before I continue on. Okay, I measured some things off camera. The circuit seems to be just fine. It's just drawing too much current. Some things I can do is maybe take out one of these diodes and replace it with a resistor so that the voltage drop between the two bases here is lower and we get less bias current. Another thing I could do, you know, if I move this point to here or here, then we'll start having problems with offset. You know, this needs to be symmetrical as possible. And if that happens, then I have to start adding more parts to, you know, correct for that. And if this is symmetrical, I don't get much of an offset. I think I'm getting like 40 millivolts, which is fine for this circuit. So I have another idea, is to put a resistor from this base to this base and shunt a certain amount of current around the diodes. That way they can uh, still thermally track, but it will lower the voltage between these. I'm not sure if it would desensitize them enough that they wouldn't thermally track very good, but... You know, it's something to try. So the question is, well, what would be the value of this resistor? Well, we have a voltage drop between 1.2, 1.4. Well, 
It's usually uh, around 0.65, we'll just say 1.3 volts between these two points. And we want to shunt, uh, I don't know, this is where it's kind of a guessing game. Without fully characterizing these transistors and everything, these diodes, yeah, it's a little bit of a guess. You know, you have to um, model it in spice. But uh, anyway, if I take 1.3, we have 75. Let's say we uh, shunt like 55 milliamps, maybe. 1.3 volts divided by 0.055. Yeah, that's uh, 23.6 ohms. The closest thing I'm going to have is probably 22 ohms. So let's pop that in there and see what happens. Okay, so I drew it in the circuit here. And yeah, I did put little balls on my connections. I always get people complaining that I don't put little connection nodes. And I don't really like doing that. Where I connect, I just show you know, the wires touching. Where it doesn't connect, I put a little break in one of the wires. But yeah, just to satisfy people, I drew the little balls on the connections, whatever. Okay, anyway. So yeah, I put in that resistor right here. It doesn't have to be this big. It's you know, the only one I could quickly find. Uh, having problems finding components, or mainly resistors. I just have them in big piles and drawers with different wattage values. But anyway, let's fire up the power supply. Uh, matter which one no okay it might be a little low well it was I did calculate 23.6 but you know I only have uh, certain values let's see what happens here let's see if I can measure the bias flowing in the output stage so what I do, I just measure across the 0.22 ohms. I can do, do it with the camera in the way here, not short anything out. Uh, 8 millivolts. Oops, see I shorted something out. Hopefully I didn't, I didn't blow anything up. So you take 0 0.008 divided by 0.44. That's those two resistors in series. And we're running 18 milliamps. That's, yeah, that's okay. Maybe a little on the low side, but that'll work. I'm sure when this warms up, it will uh, you know, draw a little more current. Another thing I can do is unhook that resistor so the current shoots way up and let this get hot and put it back in and see if these diodes are tracking or not. Okay, so that's what I did. I unhooked it and let it warm up and went on and did a few things for several minutes. And the current went up, but it cooled back down. Kind of surprising since the diodes aren't in really good thermal contact. So yeah, this is not desensitizing those diodes. That's good. Uh, to thermal tracking, I should say. And this heatsink is undersized, by the way. You know, it will get hot. So yeah, I'll have to watch that. I don't really have a good enough heatsink to throw on there. I can probably... You know, I don't know, just tape it or something. Use that thermal tape. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not too worried about it at this point. Well, I guess we're at a point we can uh, put some music through it and see what it does. <laughs> Whoops, I can't play that. Darn it, I have to go back to the YouTube music. Well, if you're wondering, that's a band called Bang from the early 70s. One of my favorite bands from that era. They just didn't get anywhere, though. Their song lyrics had meaning, well-produced, you know, talented. Just didn't get anywhere. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Okay, there's a music sample. Again, we don't have feedback closed in. Now I'm curious of the output power of this circuit. Well, I'll hook it up to my 4 ohm load and we'll scope the output and see what we get. Okay, it's at the point just before clipping, about 4.55 volts or so. See, there's clipping. So uh, that's an RMS value divided by 4. Uh, just over 5 watts. You know, with plus and minus 12 volt rails, I would expect to do better than that. I would expect somewhere around 10 watts. Where's half of my powers? You know, it's like giving somebody $10 and only getting 5 of something back. So, not so good. I would like to do a little better than that. So here's the problem with the circuit. With these 220 ohm resistors here, we're running about 55 milliamps in the base circuit of the output section of the amplifier. Even though this op amp can push and pull beyond 75 milliamps, it can't really push current or pull it because of these, uh, these diodes here. I could connect it down here and then have an offset issue and then add a bootstrap circuit here to take care of that. But I want to keep this connected here. So what I can do in that case is add a bootstrap circuit to the top and to the bottom. So let me draw that in here so I can explain a little bit what's going on. I won't go in depth of how bootstrapping works because I made a video about it. But with current flowing through the circuit, you know, the way I have it set up, it's about 5 volts across this resistor. So when we bring some AC back through this capacitor, you know, this will be the signal current, and you put a scope, one channel here, the other channel here, you'll see a waveform moving together with that same voltage separation, in this case around 5 volts. So even with the signal, it's keeping a constant voltage across this resistor, and that equates to constant current through that resistor. So this is behaving as a constant current source. You see, without the bootstrap circuit here, just when we had that one resistor, when the voltage swings towards the rail, the voltage across that resistor gets less and less. And, you know, when the voltage drop across the resistor is less, there'll be less current flowing through that resistor and we have less current to pass through the base emitter junction of the transistor and you end up current starved. You don't have enough current to get the full output when the signal is near to the rail. Same thing on the bottom here, on the negative side. Okay, I got the bootstrap circuits in. These are the caps. Let's see what we get here. It's clipping on the bottom. Pull it out of clipping a little bit. 5.67 volts it looks like. So now we're getting 8 watts. Getting closer. I was hoping to get 10, but it may not be possible with this circuit. We're using a 4 ohm load. But, you know, uh, I'm kind of curious though. Bootstrapping might give me enough current that I can actually reduce the current in the base part of the output stage so, so I just might try that just to see what happens well the answer to that is yeah I still get about the same output but I do have to rebias this thing because now you, know, you can see the crossover distortion yeah, I'm not putting enough current through it to uh, bias it yeah, you know, the total circuit now is only drawing 20 milliamps, so that kind of fixes another problem. It fixes requiring to have so much current flowing in the base part of the output stage. So it eliminates that issue. But yeah, let me rebias this thing and uh, see if I can get it working again. Yeah, maybe a little bit less signal. 
5.3 volts. I'm not sure about this waveform. It's just not looking sinusoidal. It looks like there's uh, a lot of third harmonic in there, changing the shape of the top and the bottom. I have to look at the uh, spectrum analyzer. Yeah, we got a massive harmonic. This is my pilot signal, 4.5. That's 1%. And this thing is shooting way up there. We can dial that down. So, whatever that is, it's probably, let's see, uh, 2, 4, maybe 5 or 6%, I'd guess. Again, this feedback loop isn't closed in, but you know, like when I designed my JT501, you want to have the least distortion as possible before you close the feedback loop. And uh, yeah, this is a bit much. I'm going to see if I can get that lower. I might try increasing the current again because I'm starting to get this weird looking waveform. Okay, we started at 100s, went up to 470s, and so now I went down to 220s, rebiased the amplifier. And now that, look at that third now, it's just over 1%. That's very good. I'll take that any day. But let's see what our output looks like here. So let's turn the math thingy off, turn this thingy up, and uh, it's bobbing around because I have my pilot signal turned on. That's why the signal's vibrating like that. Well, if I remember to put more waveforms on the screen, so uh, it was 5.61. Just run with that. So that's 7.86, you know, about 7.9 watts. So we didn't lose much. But we really cut the amount of current the amp is drawing, you know, the idle current. So, yeah, much, much better where I want to be. So now, I think this is where it's going to go horribly wrong. I'll close in the feedback loop and uh, see what happens here. It'll probably turn into a giant oscillator, but... Yeah, that's the final straw here. Let's see what happens. Okay, so I closed in the feedback loop, so it's global now, coming from the output. So uh, that's the fundamental, again, the pilot signal. And it's a little second-order harmonic. You notice the third is gone completely. There's a little blip down there. Yeah, I don't know what is that, probably 0.3%, uh, I guess. Probably as good as it's going to get laid out on the board this way. Uh, output power is the same. That didn't really change. So around just shy of 8 watts. And uh, at least it's not... Uh, I don't see any oscillating or any weird stuff going on. So let's take a look at clipping here. Yeah, it just clips. It's all nothing weird going on. So, yeah, I wish I could get it a little more symmetrical. I'd be able to squeak out just a little bit more power, I think. Okay, tinkered around a little bit. I was using clip leads on the load, which causes extra drop. So I shortened that up, put larger supply bypass caps on, see if that would make a difference. Problem with these boards, you wiggle components and the signal goes up slightly. It's just these boards, you, they're not great for this. But I ended up with um, 8.1 watts. And uh, put all the values of the final design here if you want to tinker with this yourself. So, in conclusion, this little amplifier driven with the 4556, keeping it simple, just two output transistors. It works. I was able to get the current in the base part of the output stage lower, down to about 30 milliamps. 
Thermal stability is good. It's not running away or anything. Like I say, I am using a undersized heat sink. And the diodes are not in proper contact, so it does take it some time to drop back down to its normal bias level after running it hot for a while. At least it doesn't go the other way and, you know, increase, increase, and thermally run away. A yeah, quick check of the distortions, not bad. No oscillations or anything. I guess really the only area I'm disappointed in is output power. I did get 8 watts at 4 ohms. I was hoping to get up to 10. You know, maybe solder it up on a board. I might be able to squeak a little bit more out of it. Well, I can continue on and tinker and tinker, but now I'm just going to put the wraps here. The video's getting long. And that'll do it for this one. Thanks for watching.